I now want to talk a little bit about how to create acceleration vectors. In the previous part of the video, I showed you two out of three motion diagrams where we had a change in velocity, and I said that therefore we would have a non-zero acceleration. We can use our vectors to actually create our acceleration vector in a graphical manner. The important thing to remember is that we need to use the change in velocity. Right now, we can think about average acceleration, and that's going to be, be defined very similar to average velocity, and that it's the change in velocity divided by time. For average velocity, we said it was the change in position, the displacement, divided by our time interval. And again, for motion diagrams, our time intervals are always the same. So all we need to do to create our acceleration vector is to find this change in velocity vector and then create our acceleration vector in the same direction and in the same length as that. So the first thing to remember is, of course, what does this delta mean? And that is going to be equal to final minus initial. So any time that I have a delta, you need to say that that's my final value minus my initial value. Now note that this is going to be vector subtraction. So because I have vector subtraction, the way to do that, which has been covered in the vector video, if you aren't familiar with this, is to say that this is the same thing as adding my negative vector. And it's really important to do it that way. So this tactics box kind of guides you through that if you have your initial velocity and your final velocity, what you do is you take your final velocity and you now are going to add the negative of your initial velocity. So to go from your initial velocity to the negative, all you're doing is actually making it go in the opposite direction. So start at the tip and go to the tail, as this shows. So now when we add them, your answer goes from the uh, tail of your first vector, uh, your final vector, to the tip of your second vector. And so you start here and you go there. Note that the difference in position here is just so you could see them clearly. You could have stacked these on top of one another. So this is how this image gets to delta v. And then our delta v is going to be translated into acceleration vector, which again, we're dividing by a delta t value that's unknown, but the important thing in motion diagrams is that the direction is correct and the relative size between different acceleration vectors is the same. So I'm going to talk you through an analysis now where we're actually going to create these acceleration vectors. Now one thing to realize is that we need to really simplify and think about what the situation is. So there's already a sketch that appears here, but this sketch in itself is a simplification of a sled going down a snowy hill. Hills, of course, are not perfectly straight triangles, but this is a reasonable physics assum assumption. Now, a second simplification that we can make is that of the particle model, that right now you can actually see these sleds and that's a little confusing. So one thing that we're going to do in most motion diagrams is to really just draw one dot that represents the position of our object. We're not going to worry about the size or shape or color of the object, since those things in general do not impact the physics. Now, at the very end of the class, we'll talk about rotational motion, and then that won't be true anymore. But for translational motion, which is what we'll deal with for the vast majority of the class, we will be able to approximate our object as just one dot, a particle. So now I could start by drawing the displacement vectors, but we know that the displacement vector just turns into the velocity vector by knowing that the time interval is the same. So I can actually just start by drawing my average velocity vector here. Uh, so my first velocity goes there, and so on. So each of these velocity vectors is using the fact that I can visually see what my displacement vector is between these points and that the delta t is the same. So once I have these velocity vectors, you can see that it's in fact increasing in size each time. However, they all point in the same direction. So we can then say, how do we actually find my acceleration vector? So remember that our average acceleration is going to be the change in velocity over time. And so if I want to look at just this initial acceleration here, 
I have that my final velocity is v2, since that's my second one. That comes after v1, which is initial. So my subtraction is then v2 minus v1. And it's important to actually write that out explicitly so that when you think about this, I say that I'm adding to v2 my negative of v1. And it's important since if you flip that, you get the wrong thing. So one thing to remember about vectors is that you can move them around on your page and it doesn't actually change anything about the vector. So let me try to draw v2. Let's see, does that look pretty similar to v2 here? I hope it does. And then I want to draw the negative of v1, which looks something like that. So this is my negative v1 vector. So now to get my sum, I start at the tail of my first vector and I go to the tip of my second one. And again, these are one dimensional vectors. I've just separated them a little bit for clarity's sake. And so this is my delta v. So my first acceleration here, which I'm going to draw a little bit off to the side, is something like this. So I can call this a1. Now I can actually repeat this process and look at the difference between v3 and v2, v4 and v3. Now I didn't show them all done out graphically, but you would do it the same way here, saying v3 minus v2 and v4 minus v3. And you would actually get the same acceleration in this situation for reasons that we'll talk about near the end of uh, this, the week. Uh, this comes at the end of chapter 2. But even if you did it out graphically, you would see that when you subtract v3 from v4, you get the same vector that you get every single time. So note that because we had four velocity vectors and we're subtracting them, you only end up with three acceleration vectors. But in this case, we see that it's a constant acceleration in that the vectors are the same size and they're in the same direction. Now, the directionality here is really important, that it's not just to the right or down, it's along this angle. And one thing we can do if we want to talk about directions is I can call this, in fact, the, perpen sorry, the parallel direction. So if we're going along the slope, we can say parallel, and that little up arrow is a hat that represents a unit vector, which we'll talk about more in chapter three and was briefly covered in the vector video. And if I wanted to talk about the direction perpendicular to the surface, I can use this symbol. So if you want to talk about the directions that are uh, parallel or perpendicular, we do have a symbol for that. So briefly, I want to show you a similar situation to what we just talked about, but drawn a little bit better. This is again on an incline, but now we're not showing sleds. Again, we've simplified it down to a particle model, and you can see that the velocity vectors in green are looking just like the displacement vectors, and that's because your delta t is the same in each situation. Now you can more clearly see your acceleration vectors. One thing that's important to note is that the book is really consistent about the colors it uses for different vectors. I may or may not be as good when I'm annotating the video, especially if I'm using images from other sources. And in your work, you're probably not going to have a really consistent color scheme. So it's important to make sure that you're always labeling the rows of vectors so I know that these are the accelerations and these are the velocities. And again, it isn't necessary to show the displacement vectors, since in this case, what you really want is the velocities and accelerations. So to briefly summarize a little bit about how we simplify to make motion diagrams, one of the things that's important is to decide whether or not it's appropriate to model our object as a particle, just the dot. And in general, initially, we're going to be talking about situations where that's true. If we're talking about an object's rotation, that won't be true, but that won't be occurring for many weeks. But this is an important simplification that we're making right now. And whenever you're trying to read a description of a real-world situation, you need to decide what you're going to simplify. And later videos will talk about this in a little more detail, but you need to think about, for instance, which aspects of the motion are most important. We then draw this motion diagram as a way to visualize the situation. So we need to use multiple dots to represent multiple frames of the video. And what's important here is that you don't want to overcrowd the motion diagram that you're making, but you need to have enough dots to really represent the motion. Again, we assume that it's moving slowly in between these dots, 
So if you have a car, for instance, that's slowing down, stopping, and then starting again, you need more dots to represent that than if it was a car traveling at a constant speed. If you want to create velocity vectors, you're actually creating average velocity vectors, and we do that by linking two position dots. Again, this is in a way the displacement vector, but since every frame is separated by the same delta t, we can use that to create average velocity vectors. Finally, we can create average acceleration vectors by subtracting two velocity vectors. This then is going to be drawn to the side of a dot while the velocity vectors were in between dots. That way you're showing that you've used two subsequent velocity vectors to actually create that acceleration vector. One thing to note is if your velocity is unchanging, you have zero acceleration, it's very helpful to actually use this zero vector to indicate that. Finally, please make sure that you're labeling your vectors so it's clear what are your velocity vectors and what are your acceleration vectors. I'd now like to show you a motion diagram, and one of the things that you might need to do with motion diagrams is actually interpret them and come up with a possible situation that this corresponds to. So one thing to note here is that you want to look at the direction, that because the motion diagram is actually oriented in an up and down direction, we can assume that the motion itself is going in that direction. So don't just turn this on the side because there's more space that way. This, the fact that this shows this in the direction that I would call, in fact, the y direction, we frequently say that up is the positive y direction, that we see that the motion is happening in the, the y direction, or negative y, in fact. So the next thing you want to do is figure out which of these spots is the starting point. And what I can see is that it's moving faster at the bottom than it is at the top. And it's also moving downwards. So it's really hard if it started at the bottom for it to end up at the top if the velocity is downwards. This is just kind of common sense. So since it goes uh, in a downwards velocity, we can say that it's starting at the top and going downwards. We also see that we have two acceleration vectors here, and note that that's the appropriate number since we only have three velocity vectors. Now, not only have these been labeled acceleration, but the subscript here, which is in fact two whole words, says free fall. And that in itself should tell you that this is an object in free fall, meaning falling under the force of gravity. And these two vectors are the same. When we talk about free fall in a little bit, you'll see that the acceleration on, for an object in free fall is always the same. So you do, in fact, expect that these are the same. Now, one thing that's not very clear from this is that your initial velocity at this initial point, so your initial velocity, is in fact equal to zero. It's starting from rest. And one of the ways that I would figure that out is by saying that each time my velocity is increasing by this amount. So if I can look at this vector, which represents my initial velocity or my average velocity between these two points and my acceleration, I see that I really can't make it go up any further because this average velocity is just equal to my acceleration. So that's one way to realize that you're looking at an object that is really starting from rest at this position and is then falling downwards. Now we don't know what happens after this point. Perhaps it's hit the ground, perhaps it continues to fall, but we were only interested in this portion of the motion. So please don't extrapolate beyond what you're shown since we don't actually know what happens after that point. So finally, to summarize, we say that motion diagrams are like frames of a video, but each frame is on top of one another. So it's important just to know that the time interval between subsequent points must be equal. You should interpret them that way and you must draw them that way. We can actually find the average velocity from displacement vectors and from knowing that the time interval is the same. And we can look at acceleration, again average acceleration, from looking at what the change in velocity is, which you find from subtracting the vectors, and again knowing that the time interval is the same. Finally, in most cases we can simplify our objects to points, so we just draw dots. This is also going to be important when we get to free body diagrams, where we also just draw dots. You won't be able to make that assumption if we're talking about an object that is rotating, but you shouldn't expect to see that for some time.